inspired by this book originally written in English. Um, it was such an important book for me because it showcased the experiences that uh, Dr. Lashi Kanushi went through um, in his formative years and it really proved to me how important it is in the chosen field that you have to not just have the right temperament but to understand the world by going through its experiences and understanding through empathy the lens of, of every person regardless of uh, their ideology and it's not something you it's not something that is normally gone through by many uh, scholars especially some scholars and in the Levite tradition as an Islamist he remains one of the credible voices that when he proclaims yeah, I'm no longer an Islamist, I'm no longer a Democrat, my dear I tell you, it sent shockwaves throughout the world I was in um, Tunisia a couple of years back we were together at the Zoo I remember the Enahda Party Convention where this became a very heated debate and of course people were really, especially the Western media completely flawed when the declaration came to be but the crucial bit is the impact. You want this book, the thoughts, the experience to basically guide the next generation. In a world where we have Trump and we have fake news being readily available, it's really a world that is completely without a clear cut um, sort of you know moral compass. And it really becomes more incumbent on us to spread certain positions um, and make sure they become part of the mainstream psyche. And because of that, when asked to come here today, I did not hesitate. I would like to assure Dr. Azhar Khanini, it is very rare for such work. Uh, you are not only um, the chairman of Antiwar Television now, Antiwar Channel, but uh, the, the books that are often, often quoted uh, in regards to you, which is of course Hamas, Unwritten Chapters, and of course secondly, Rashid Anushi, a Democrat with Islamism. Now this book, I am telling you, you know, with great authority, to my knowledge, has been read, uh, read by not only uh, politicians and members of parliament from the opposition, but also the government. And it's a testament how crucial it is because as you move forward, um, people can skew many theories, people can have many viewpoints, but to actually have uh, a written format, the living example of a leader like a Shi and how many people actually resonate with that kind of value and that kind of experiences will have unimaginable impact to the politics of today. Now, I also want to say a, a few things. I believe it would be incomplete if we don't confront some of the controversies, some of the problems that we face. The name Ayman al-Zawahiri, uh, I think it was just mentioned just now, but Azam, now many people know of him as the leader of Al-Qaeda, not many know that he's an eye surgeon. And not many also realize that most of the foreign fighters from Malaysia who are flying to Daesh, six times per capita more than Indonesia as of 2015 are mostly engineers such as myself and inshallah the Rahman so it means if there's a clear cut um, problem that we have to address and does it mean that we fall victim to the prevailing fake news or truths that are being propped up by certain groups? No young people who are here concerned citizens who are here, I believe it is more incumbent on you to not just be well read, but understand the reality as it stands. I um, wanted to state here, one of the books that I just uh, finished was written by an ulama from uh, al uh, It was in Indonesian, a translation, Radical Islam, and it basically uh, summarizes the thought process held by many mainstream ulamas and zeroes in the problem of takfiri to just Muhammad Kutub and Sayyid Kutub. And of course, you know, uh, 
factually, when you take things out of context, it's so easy to basically say this is the problem, and if we didn't have these thinkers, if we didn't have the F1, the world would be a better place, and we will not be confronted by the evil, this courage that is Daesh. And I think that cannot be further from the truth. The fact that Ayman al Zawahiri states that he is the anointed son. He is the only one that knows how to interpret properly the thinking uh, of, of Sayyid Qutub uh, basically validates our position that we are taking things and allowing things to be taken out of context that we, if not uh, having the right courage to fight back, to push back will just allow ourselves to be apologetic Islamists uh, Why? Because you have a certain support base from a certain ideology Please, please let's not forget there are many autocrats out there, despotic regimes, completely um, atheists, completely godless, but the ones that are being targeted, of course, has always been Islamists. And I think this is an unfair categorization. When we were in Tunisia, the Zul will remember, clearly uh, the inference is made on the Christian Democrats. You know, proud Christians, but also proud politicians, and there's absolutely nothing wrong if Islamists would like to be part of the political system. Now, the question therefore comes to the point, you know, when you understand and you realize they are right to be participating in a political system, of course, we also would like to advocate from our particular point of view, you also have to be inclusive and accommodating. And I come from a multiracial party, we chose a party not to represent a particular group or race and we stand proud with the fact that Malaysia as a multiracial nation would need to embrace diversity as its main strength. So, in sum, regardless who you are, I believe the message that is inherent in this book is to be unashamed, to be truthful, to be proud and to always realize, despite the craziness and the hypocrisy of the world at large, nothing justifies cynicism. I would like to end um, by also maybe extending my big gratitude and thanks. I know it has not been easy for Dr. Azam to continue his work with his voice. Uh, most of which I agree with, some perhaps I have disagreements with, but he has remained steadfast um, during my earlier years. I think before I joined politics uh, actively, he was also in Malaysia discussing the Abrahamic faith that three different groupings share in the Middle East. And um, I see that he hasn't lost any of his uh, vibrant, uh, passionate voice. And I'm sure that that is something that has always given us impetus and inspired us until today. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please make sure by the end of 2018, not only have you read this, you have to ensure that it, its message, its um, you know, key points would have been shared by at least 10 other people. And if we have that commitment, that realization, that we stand tall, um, in our identity, in various hues of being a Muslim. Some could be more Islamist, some could be more democratic. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to start embracing and taking pride, including in engaging with those of other faiths. With that, um, I am very proud to present to you our panel, and I am very proud to be part of this initiative. Congratulations, Ayala, and the Tarot, make sure you keep it coming. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
and the, the intellectual, the Bayern's intellectual discourse, and we very much would like for the fruits of uh, our discussions here to be shared by average people, by the masses, by, by, by people who probably do not think about Islam and politics in their everyday life, but yet they could think about the values uh, that we are talking here and uh, uh, their politics. Same, I think, uh, is happening in Tunisia when uh, these Muslim Democrats they shake in the discourse and launch the waves in the Muslim world, and at the same time, Tunisia remains the main supplier of the Irish fighters in the world. Possibly a champion only before my own country, unfortunately. Uh, with this, um, I'm very sorry to inform you that I think we'll have to excuse your Lisa because she will have to leave. Uh, she will have to leave early, uh, but, but I hope she will stay for a while. To Participate a little bit, and I'm passing the microphone to um, Dr. Dr. Ahmad Farid Musa, who will moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, first of all, as uh, last night, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Santorini again. Uh, and you, Rosa, I know that you know, like, it's difficult for you to travel from all the way from uh, Turkey and arriving here and have to be here and have to rush to Alaska to Dr. Zul Abiman, Shah Abiman, and to my Masul Shah Abiman. Welcome. And we are happy to, to have you over here. And um, normally, normally for those who have attended IRF events, you should know that I would normally start with my presentation. But today I decided not to have any slides presentation because after hearing what Dr. Azam Tamimi spoke last night, I know I I thought that no I I should not want to do I have any more slides today. So you know like uh, what um, Julia mentioned that you know Russian Revolution made a bold stand and Mulaza also said he made bold bold stand to say that you know we have no more Islamists, we are Muslim Democrat. Dr. Azam Tamimi you know did not agree with that with the proposition. And you know, like I don't want to complicate things. You know. I have better leave it to you, you the expert, you have to leave with uh, Sheikh Rashid Kanushi, and I think it's time for us to hear from you. Your side. Uh, your welcome. Thank you. I wrote uh, a couple of uh, pages 
explaining that I was interested in investigating Islam and democracy. Never received a reply except from one university. The university I received a reply from was the University of Westminster. And it was a personal reply from Professor John Keane, the director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University. He said to me in the letter, Dear Azam, I don't know how your letter arrived at my desk. <laughs> but I'm really curious, what has Islam got to do with democracy? Come, I want to see you. Can you come to my house? He left his Denver number, I called him, and he said, come immediately. So I went, he wasn't far. I was in Cricklewood, he was in Kentish Town, so not far away. He said, I'm busy today, I just have half an hour, I just want to understand what is it that you are talking about, and our meeting lasted three hours. <laughs> Toward the end of the meeting, he said, Azam, this is the way he usually addressed me, Azam, now he's in Australia. Apparently, I know nothing about Islam. And clearly, you know very little about Western thought. So what about this? From now on, you are my teacher about Islam, and I am your teacher about Western thoughts. And that was the beginning of my PhD thesis, supervised by John Key. We started in the beginning by investigating whether Islam and democracy were <coughs> compatible. Soon we moved to proving that secularism was actually incompatible with democracy. And we organized a conference in 1994 that was then published in a book edited by me and John Esposito called Islam and Secularism in the Middle East. John Keane by then became convinced that the real problem is with secularism and not with Islam. I introduced Rashid Ganushi to him, invited Rashid Ganushi to our center, the Center for the Study of Democracy, to present a paper about Islam and the West. And John Keane took me in the afternoon to a cafe shop near the university and said to me, Azam, if you want to do a thesis that people would love, to read as a book and will immediately be published, then let's change the topic to Rashid Ganushi. <laughs> he was so impressed by Rashid Ganushi, clever, innovative person with deep analysis. Let's do Islamic democracy but through the thinking of Rashid Ganushi. And let me tell you a secret. By that time, Rashid Ganushi had not written a word about civil society or secularism. It was my questions to him about civil society and secularism that brought out of him the treasure of ideas. This is a man who has the ability to generate ideas when you present him with a problem. Lucky for me, that resulted in a good book. I hope you agree with me that it's a good book once you've read the Malay translation. <laughs> now, Rashid Ganushi in my book is the Rashid Ganushi who led the Islamists in insisting that democracy and Islam were fully compatible. In my book, I argue through the thinking of Rashid Ganushi, which I managed to get out of him through uh, hundreds of hours of uh, discussions, which are all recorded, I have them on record, that democracy in the Arab world, and I dare say even in the Muslim world, is hindered primarily not by Islam or the Islamists. It is hindered primarily by the world order, which hates to see democratization in our part of the world, because democratization of our systems will mean less corruption, will mean more accountability, 
will mean more empowerment of the human being in our countries. More independence of the former colonial powers that continue to have so much influence on our lives, whether we like it or not. Then, there is the modern territorial state. I don't call it a nation state, because in the European case, it is, it was a nation state. In the case of the Arab world, and probably many parts of the Muslim world, it is a territorial state, because its boundaries were driven, were, were uh, drawn by colonial powers, and it was not really representative of an entity that had a unique identity compared to its neighbors. Their territorial state is so resistant to democratization in its shape because once democratization succeeds, the borders would fall. And that's what the Arab Spring promised. The Arab Spring, had it succeeded in Tunisia and Libya, I was sure that soon the borders between the two countries would be removed from those sands. Egypt and Libya, the same thing. Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, one country, one people, one past, and most probably one future. Those lines drawn in the sand by Sachs Pico and those who came after them are all artificial. And the territorial state created by colonial powers is resistant to democratization because democratization is a threat to this division within our own ummah. Then there is secularism. Secularism did not come to the Muslim world through natural evolution. It wasn't a revolution like in Europe against despotism, against a church that in the name of the divine oppressed the people and persecuted them. Secularism or secularization in the Western history, in the European history, is fully understandable. And it resulted in liberal democracy in many of those countries, in progress, in success. But in our case, secularism came to us on the colonial tank. It came to us through colonial authorities that destroyed our societies, destroyed the traditional endowment or awqaf institution that for more than a thousand years was independent of political authority and funded independent schools and universities to which people came from all over the world to seek knowledge. Secularism, as is imposed in much of the Muslim world, is an imported, deformed commodity that, said, that has sought to diminish and to uh, minimize the role of Islam in our lives under the pretext that religion causes backwardness. That's not the case in our history. In our history, we were glorious, we were great, we were successful when we abided by the values of our religion. But when we gave up those values and ran after important deformed commodities, we lost all the, glo the glory and we lost all the respect our ancestors one day had. Then there is a the problem of civil society, and there is a chapter in the book about civil society. What does civil society mean? How it evolved? What is the story? And how the term was used throughout the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, and part of the 90s, in order to deny Islamic organizations the designation of civil society institutions. The purpose was to exclude them from political process to exclude them from legality. What you will find in this book is a message to the world. First, that democracy in the present time is a solution to our problems. But democracy has to evolve through our own thinking. It cannot be a cut and paste thing. And that's why we believe we can generate a form of democracy that is different from liberal democracy. But there is no harm in beginning with what we have. And what we have is a, is a system consisting of two components. And it is the procedural component that we need to focus on and develop. 
As for the, ideology, the ideological component, that was the product of a certain context, and it would be a crime against humanity and a crime against our own culture and religion to import it as it is, and here I mean liberalism. Now today, after the Arab Spring has suffered as a result of the plot against it by powers that felt threatened by its success, and I mean here Israel, the United, the United, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, who today form a coalition among themselves. Within Islamic ranks, there is a lot of confusion. Like the question, can an Islamist be a democrat? Actually, this question should never be asked. Because Rashid Ganoushi is an example. A democrat within Islamism. When I wrote about Rashid Ganoushi, he was a leading Islamist. And I defended his ideas as a democrat. The thesis of the book is that there is no incompatibility between being an Islamist and being a democrat. But let's ask a simple question. I know our sister gave a brief definition of what an Islamist is in her introduction, but what do we mean by an Islamist? Is it a negative term or a positive term? When you hear someone say, this person is an Islamist, what feeling do you get? There was a time that it didn't really matter much if people called, the, called us uh, Islamists. But today, many of us feel uneasy. And they prefer to call themselves something else. I'd say call yourself whatever you like. Yeah. It doesn't matter. What matters is what you carry of ideas. And the idea a Muslim carries is that we have a mission in life. Of course, there are Muslims who don't carry a mission. That's their choice. They are lazy Muslims. We need to encourage them to be less lazy, to be more involved. But a Muslim, a pious Muslim, is one who knows that he or she one day will meet their Lord. And this life is only a passage. It's a passage toward an akhirah. We are not just any creatures. We are not any human beings. We are people who have a message. وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Believing men and believing women. They form a unity among themselves. They enjoin the good and forbid the evil. What does it mean to enjoy the good and forbid the evil? It means to be active. It means to be concerned. It means to be interested. It means to be involved. You cannot be a Muslim sitting on the peripheries. That's a lazy Muslim. I don't deny you that designation of a Muslim. You are a Muslim since you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. But I'd say to you, be careful, brother. Be careful, sister. This is not what you are supposed to be. You are supposed to be involved. What do we do about corruption in our society? What do we do about injustice? What do we do about the oppression of our brothers and sisters around the world? What do we do about someone like Trump and his lackeys, Muhammad bin Salman and Muhammad bin Zayed, who are destroying the Ummah, left and right? Are we to be indifferent or are we to do something about it? The moment you want to do something about it, you are a political person. You are an active person. Does that mean you are an Islamist? By all means, I am an Islamist. I'm not ashamed of being an Islamist. A member of the Muslim Brotherhood, the greatest movement in modern history that seeks to change the world to the better. And that's why they collaborated against our brother, Dr. Muhammad Mursi, when he made the slogan, we will not progress until we make our food, we make our medicine, and we make our weapons. Why should we remain lackeys, dependent on left and right? I mean, you just need to, once this is over, search for the recent declaration between Saudi Arabia and Britain following the visit of Mohammed bin Salman to Britain. Neo-colonialism. 
Once more, Saudi Arabia is a British colony. And now he's going to Washington, he will also hand Saudi Arabia to the Americans. Saudi Arabia has had oil for nearly a hundred years. And until today, they cannot be independent in education. They cannot be independent in health. They cannot be independent in anything. Why? Because the people of Saudi Arabia have no choice. They cannot go to a polling station. They cannot vote. They cannot choose their leaders. We need to struggle for democracy, but we need to struggle from within the house of Islam. And never, ever be ashamed about being a Muslim and a committed Muslim. Wassalamu alaikum. Thank you. Speech and video for you who uh, have not been acquainted with the Gaza. It's, it's like this. Always be like this. I told Rahman, you know, the first time I met with Rahman, his son, he said, Father said, Fire it. There, there you are. You know, that's the Gaza for me. So I think that we have uh, enough interesting uh, practice today. And I would like first to invite my Masul, uh, Shem Kurwa to present his views on all this particular topic. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Salatu salamu ala rasulillah. I don't know how to deliver my idea. Al-Azam Banwari. Why is it? When I... I just told this now, I told Azim, are you angry or not? Are you angry? I'm not angry. But this book is special. There's only one copy like this in the world. No one does that, that's what I miss. Because this book is written here to Brother Sa'ari Sungi. With my best wishes and doa for you to remain steadfast. May Allah reward you and what you wish. Pleasant deliverance, Azam Khamemi, 31st March 2002. This book was read or sent to prison. When I was, when I was incarcerated for one for two years in the prison. After one year of our uh, detention, we were tried by the infamous law of Criminal of, of Malaysia, is Internet Security Act. Uh, I was informed by my uh, daughter and my wife that Brother Azam is given this. When uh, they visited me, I was in the camp. I was only given to, I was only short, I got a touch. We were separated by fans uh, in the two, that do the size of the room. So I was waiting very much, uh, very hard. I wish that I can read this book. And finally, Brother Azam, he reached me. On the 9th of April, so then, after 9 days of screening, the tapis, the particular tapis. So, I decided, uh, we have decided that after one year of our incarceration, imprisonment, detention, maybe I say, we would like to launch what we call as Mogo Lapa, hunger strike. By then, we were together with Jesus' mother. And my brain was proclaimed and pronounced as prisoners of conscience. Seven of us, they provide a big shame to the present chairman of Arabat, Tunani. <laughs> During that time, he was, the, he was the prime minister. Whenever you go, people will ask, what, what is your stand? What do you do to the seven militia, your people, that is being uh, pronounce and uh, proclaim as prisoners of function. He can say that Anwar is decided by the court, but he couldn't reply for the citizens. Because if he did it, he got tried. So we really enjoy the game, mind you. Living in prison without detention, that is more of a mind me. How we believe that the government is serious and how government will think that we are serious. When we decided to, pro, uh, to go, go for an hunger strike, which decided for only 10 days. 
But the day decided was that we decided on the 8th day we will prepare, we will feature total hunger strike. Which means you don't drink, you don't eat. Hunger strike means you, you can drink some sort of inputs, some solution to maintain the, uh, the level of uh, level of uh, salt in your, in your body. But when we decided that you are going to launch total hunger strike, it means you do not drink and you don't eat. My son, Dan Musana, was also uh, a police. And parallel, we, do, we did in the prison, they tell over there, being the same hunger strike. So what I'm telling you, I decided when I, when I received the book on the 9th of uh, April 2002, we were going to launch our hunger strike on the 10th. I think the book is very heavy, very useful. Very interesting, but I want to test. I wanted to test how strong will be my mind during the ten days of hunger. Can I absorb? Can I digest? Can I just? I'm telling you, brother. When you launch a hunger strike, after the third days of your no eating and very limited drink, you will you will see the world is going very slow. Go ahead. You will throw something. Shut up, brother. The bed is too. You can see blue legs motion. If you speak, you are waiting that the words is coming up from your mind, from your mouth. That is the So I think, uh, I don't know whether I can finish the book if it get launched and they understand whether I will die first before they finish the book. And then that will be very sad by that. But what happened, uh, Alhamdulillah, we managed uh, on the 10th day, the Prime Minister proclaimed, made a statement that what we did was a political gesture. And we responded, yes, it, is, it was a political gesture because our detention was motivated, motivated fully by a political motive. And uh, on the 10th of uh, April, uh, on the 19th of April, we finished our this time, and I finished it. So Alhamdulillah, ten days I did the book, and ten days I did the So uh, I think uh, being on the strike, also you are okay if you read the heavy book like this. And uh, I know Prat Azam in 1977, he was very fiery, especially when we, he saw many Malaysian sisters wearing hijab. <laughs> wearing hijab coming to study to Britain alone <coughs> with the Mahra. His message was clear. Sisters, it's haram. You don't have, you don't have Mahra. You must get married. You must get married. Marry. Brothers, brothers, and brothers. Marry the sisters. Marry them. So I was in the, I was in the, I was also at the time the uh, manager of the, uh, the broker to get the sisters and brothers married. And it was the, I was the the Quraish and Kali during the Walimah, if you remember with them. That's with them. Number two, uh, in, uh, back in UK, the, the Muslim community, only student who were exposed to Islam, was introduced as the way of life. In short, the, young, the elder brothers tell us, you must understand that Islam not only really as a religion, it's a way of life. It's adult. If you feel that liberalism, capitalism, uh, communism is big agenda as a logical force, Islam is the thing. So this is our work. Because of that, uh, I think the last movie was very, if you remember, if you can remember what you mentioned just now, uh, he confessed somehow that during that time, he was, like what I said, he said like this about democracy. Remember, brother, Remember, politics is dangerous. Remember that democracy is from the Shaitan. You remember that? I remember. But that we must remember. But that was given. But uh, during that time, and, uh, in, back in 1979, we sent some delegation from our Christian brothers from, uh, we call that group, Ikhwan, Muslim Brotherhood. 
Who you like to uh, admit the group who went, even, who went to Sudan to learn from Turabi is a Muslim brotherhood? Tell me more of a rebel. Because when some brothers from the uh, United Kingdom learn about the, the movement of Hassan Turabi and Ibrahim Hassanusi, the two leaders of uh, so called Ikhwan, or Muslim brotherhood, rebel or rejected by the Dawli Ikhwan, uh, we learn a lot. We learn a lot. We believe that uh, democracy is part of the methodology of strategic for change. And I remember as early as 1978, 78, 77, 78 or 79, uh, the Malaysian writers in the UK, I was led with the Vietnam, Abu Iman, uh, I married uh, in his house, we bullied. My wife is there, he's still in there. That's 40 years. I, I was married in 1978. I married before you, brother. Yes. <laughs> Then uh, what we learned during that time was that Hassan Turabi is organizing a Muslim to get up from the, the rigid structure of working for the, the normal process of Muslim movement introduced by one is you have a very strong underground movement. You don't expose your leaders, you don't expose your people, you don't expose all the good people you have, but you introduce people whom you like to be introduced as this is modern but the, when you talk about you are going to push you going to introduce you going to give your best to the society for Islam by presenting all the best that you have then that is secondary to your thinking that you can uh, debate this uh, then brother Adam will try to defend then uh, this is what I am telling you that uh, we learn a lot from that and I believe that uh, experience uh, in UK, in the West, back 40 years ago, provide a lot of uh, value to my struggle now. And I believe that, uh, whether, I agree with that, whether you are Islamist or political Islam, it is a country that what you bring. If you bring for the change, the change must be in conformity with the Pasir Sharia. Yeah. Pasir Sharia, the higher objective of humanity, the higher objective of humanity to bring good. If our approach is through a methodology of change, forming a political, political system, if our weekend democracy is with the objective of our Mahasan, Kail, or Matalila, Alami, then you will be fine. I think that is my benchmark. If you are not clear, you will give you democracy and so on. And this is the best. And I would like to recall that Hassan Turki. I always mention this. I believe my teacher of Asam is Asam Turabi. She has to be very Asam Turabi. And after that, uh, then I read a lot from uh, Yusuf Kadawi and Ganoshi. I believe one thing about the struggle must be objective. We must be clear as regard to where we are going. The political party is important. It's not everything. Government is important, but it's not everything. Then, uh, as a therapy used to tell, he believed one thing. He believed that, uh, what he believed uh, back in 1978, 79, that strategy change must include political process, political uh, democracy, election, involvement uh, in parliamentary uh, democracy. This is part of the the human we have written as, as early as 1970s, 1870s, 1870s. Only we couldn't interpret and uh, implement until now, uh, during the time of diplomacy, uh, 1990. Brothers and sisters, I would like to end here my, end my speech here by telling you that when Asad Turabi mentioned that government is not total, I understand. I understand that government is not total. It must be a strong integration. But that was it. Get any special social, what social, uh, civil society. Islam is what civil society. Islam is what civil society. If you talk about collection of zakat, you talk about faraid, if you talk about uh, how marriage is done, 
when we talk about even implementation of certain punishment, especially if I'm wrong, this practice that is the optimus is based on the right of society, so as civil society. It's not like a uh, common law. Common law, they they right, they 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 take your right to forgive if somebody kill or hurt your threat of the right of punishment will be to the state. This is very bad. But in civil society, in the law of Kisah, uh, the right of uh, punishment, the demand to be judged, to be punished, or the right to forgive is still rest within the society. So, I believe uh, we can understand better democracy if we, if we understand that government is not total, but government is a sum total of state authority, civil society, and the conscience of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, one of the points that uh, he raised just now was the kind of change in thoughts of what I said himself. When he first explained, democracy is some check on, right? And now how he embrace democracy. So I believe many of us, uh, we have that face as well, right? And, uh, and uh, if we look back, then we appreciate more of what he had done. Uh, over the years uh, in our uh, and in our course to try and uh, take a better society and uh, 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 we so with this I would like to invite uh, my teacher Abu uh, Iman so to present his speech because he likes to be the last person right so everybody is no. Terima kasih. Thank you, Dr. Farouk. Distinguish Tazam Kamimi, Dr. Brother Ali Sumit, and certainly you distinguish audience that have been very numerous. I was with us. It's my turn to take the floor and. Surely you must have been wondering how am I going to take this on. Um, <coughs> I begin with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Very good. Evening, early evening. Um, <coughs> I was really thinking of how to have this discussion to move forward. <coughs> Could Islamists be democrat? I must admit at the outset that this definition of Islamism and Islamists unfortunately is a lexicology of scholars, not of ulama or Muslim intellectuals. Oliver Roy defined it as as such, and as well other uh, scholars on, <coughs> on Islam, Western scholars on Islam. By virtue of that, Islamism and an Islamist who undertakes Islam as our sister defined it earlier, or paraphrased it earlier, is a Muslim who undertakes the political project of finally seeing an Islamic state come into being. Much as I would want to disagree, but that is the established definition. And I have certainly problem with that. And I think a while ago, Brother Azam has attempted to redefine he took liberty to redefine an Islamist, which I think he has all the, the he's at liberty and all the liberty to, to do so. However, 
the established definition of Islamics is as defined by Oliver Roy and the other scholars of the West. Hence, if that is the case, then surely uh, it, propose, it poses a problem to us. I wouldn't want to spend my time debating and dissecting this problem. I think it's counterintuitive, counterproductive, not productive at all. If I'm going to go spend my precious time here, be talking who an Islamist is, or what Islamism is all about. But learning from the guru of Sheikh Rashid al uh, incidentally, like Brother Adam, had the opportunity of meeting him, discussing with him, <clears throat> when I was doing my PhD in London back in 89, when he had the political asylum after, after a number of war in 88, that election, and they won about 40% <coughs> of the votes, and none of the parliamentarians who stood on, on a stood as independent candidates get to the parliament because they were all banned and made, and made illegal. And Rashid Talushi refused to go into prison the second time. Found his, and he, you know, he, he, he went for political asylum in the UK and that's where, you know, I have the opportunity to meet up with this Finnish personality and I have my, you know, <coughs> my own um, ideas of Ganushi and to this day I believe that he is, if not the, you know, the guru, um, I would believe that he is the most critical and important political actor in, in the world of Islamic politics. More important than forgive me, Erdogan and others. I would want to believe that uh, Rashid Ganushi found de democracy when he was in the prison from 1981 to 84. <coughs> during his incarceration and during his isolation, he wrote in a book that he had the opportunity to reflect, ponder, and in his contemplation, revisited the writings of the thinkers of the Western Arab school of thought. And I must say here, Brother Adam, that the Western Islamist political thought are quite different from the Eastern, the Maghribi school of thought, as opposed to the, Ma the Mashriki, which brought about this construct of the Ikhwanic talk. I believe, and I strongly believe, that the Maliki school of jurisprudence brings about a very interesting uh, notion that finally saw the birth of the Maqasid of a Sharia namely by Ash-Shatibi in his book al muwafaqat fi Usul al-Sharia I'm sorry I'm not able to dwell at length on that but I would want to just make a mention of how when he, Ganushi read the book of 
Malik bin Nabi. And if I may just summarize it in in a nutshell, that when Malik bin Nabi went to do a profound studies between Islam and democracy, there's hardly any compatibility. It's worlds apart. Islam, a creed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to the Prophet Muhammad and 1400 years ago is quite opposed to democracy if you want to believe that a democracy could be you know traced back to the to the uh, very clear and the Greek by way of historicity the context of time by way of what it means, Islam is a way of life, of submission unto the Almighty, where democracy is about the rule of man. There's hardly any comparison, any compatibility. But what I now strongly believe, when Malik the Malik Nabi deconstructed democracy and found, if I may paraphrase him, found in it what is essentially the essence of democracy, that is what brings about Islam and democracy being so compatible if not reinforcing one another. And what is it? And that is about dignity of man, liberty of man, that man abhors being enslaved, subordinated, subjugated by other men. And that the essence of democracy is about liberty. While Islam is entirely about liberation of man from the domination of men of oh, okay. And when one gets to that, suddenly democracy and Islam is just hand in glove. And to be a democrat is to be is to be able to recognize the liberty of others, to be respected for all its Diversity, and that is essentially encapsulated in a verse of the Quran. A verse that I oftentimes read with your permission, and I will recite it again. And Allah Almighty declares, Ya Ayyuhannas, O mankind, this is not a verse for the believers. Not a verse to the prophet, but it's a verse announcing to the entire humanity. Ya ayuhan nas ina khalaqnakum min zakarin wa unza wa ja'annakum shu'aw wa qaba'il shu'awba wa qaba'ila li ta'araf Inna khalaqnakum min zakarin wa unza wa ja'annakum shu'awba wa qaba'ila and usually we saw that. Oh, mankind, we have created you from a single man and woman, and from that created you into <coughs> nations and tribes. Perchance that you, what is the reason for that? Perchance that you may know one another, not that you despise one another. This is the politics of the town. However, brothers and sisters, friends, what I want to stress this evening is not about that verse, but the verse that follows it. 
where Allah Almighty says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqa. Verily, the one most virtuous in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of God, Inna akramakum is the one most pious. Now, how do you understand this verse? When earlier in the verse, God talks about the plurality, diversity, and its entire pluralism in its creation. But at the end, define that the one who is most virtuous is the one that is most righteous. Or who attain the height of taqwa. I have read the exegesis of this verse that defines who is the most taqwa, who is most righteous. And behold, friends, the one defined as the most righteous is the one who is most capable and competent in managing these differences. Wow, well, I thought that is really mind blowing. For all the plurality in religion, ethnic, or what have you, God defines that ultimately, one who is defined most righteous is the one who is most capable of, it, of managing this diversity. And that is one who is truly democratic. The ability to understand and to recognize the dignity of man as he chooses to be. And Islam is what entirely against anything that is is it an anathema to this liberty. Hence, one who is truly democrat is one who is able to appreciate, recognize, and oppose and advocate the right to be what they choose to be what they choose to be, what one chooses to be. And in a truly voltaic construct, I may disagree with you, but I will defend the right for you to advocate your conviction and your belief. Fellow friends, this is what I want to submit today. That an Islamist, if ever that word is to be imposed on us, is one that can that one who is one that understands and recognizes the entire plurality of this society, but yet able to stand up and be the touch bearers of truth and justice, to recognize and relate to others as others, not relativizing or reducing them to you. I'm Muslim, you're a non-Muslim. Why must you be non-Muslim when you're supposed to be either Christian, Buddhist, atheist, agnostic, or whatever? And that is relativizing others with you. Reducing others vis-a-vis -vis you. But Islam upholds the dignity of man. And it is God given right. It's not a human right, it's a God-given right that you choose to believe what you want to believe. That is in the verse 2020. of Surah al kahfi That the truth is from God Almighty, whosoever wants to believe, believes, and whosoever wants to disbelieve, disbelieves. That is truly the liberty of, the freedom of belief. Then come, Love the cross within, there shouldn't be any compassion. I mean, I'm going through this and I'm still learning. I've learned from many shuyuf or masha'if before. But in Rashid Ganushi, I found in him a special, unique, and profound understanding of not just Islam but for today's topic, democracy. So fellow friends, I said
submit to you. Then a Muslim, call yourself Islam if I don't As one who truly understands that it is God's design that plurality and not unity is his wisdom of creation. In another verse, God says, and God will, He would have made you all just one. One. One humanity. With one religion, ethnicity, and what is it? But that is not the way God goes. Not that that's not the way He, God Almighty, designed this creation. Immediately Allah says, Walakin liya bluwa kufi ma'atakum But that is, whatever God has given you, that is this plurality thing. Then Allah says, Fastabit ul fayros. Why? One another among you to be of the best, to serve humanity. So, very philosophical. I'm sorry, politicians do speak like this. But very rare that I have this occasion to have the luxury of the intellectuals. So I take time to break from my... I've got three programs today. It's, it's looming very close. I'm in Kuala Selangor from 7, 8.30 this morning. And this is my third program. I've got one more tonight. But this opportunity, friends, really provide me with, you know, with this satisfaction of sharing with you or what I call the misunderstanding. For one who believe, who really truly believe that he really understands Islam, perchance there are still room for you to improve. And I'm still a student. I'm still learning. But I could see that the ultimate of Matasi, the ultimate of the true objective of Sharia is al karama to uphold the dignity of man. And that is truly the cardinal objective of democracy. And once you usurp his right, you deny his right, and in, and, and, and in a government that you now have in, in Malaysia, is called a fast democracy where the rule of law, where the separation of power, where one man called the Prime Minister usurp all rights, all yeah, the rights of the various branches of the government, namely the legislative, namely the judiciary, strangle and strangulate them that makes this government a dysfunctional government. And that is truly undemocratic. And totally and entirely against Islam. Right, before I confuse you further, perhaps I, I should quickly end here. But let me say this as a in conclusion, as a concluding remark, that uh, I don't want to be in this polemic of whether Islamists can be democratic. I've been, I've been harassed. I felt harassed. I felt intellectually challenged for far too long to vindicate and to justify yourself that you are democrats. But when I come and when I revisit all this, I come to realize that there's a lot more. That even Western democracy and liberal democracy is at loggerhead with the true meaning of democracy. If the true meaning of democracy is finally to uphold the liberty and dignity of men. I thank you. I thank you for your attention.
uh, in general as an uh, an uh, Islamic politics, I would call as an expert or an, an, an observer generally. How do you see situation in Muslim societies, which is not Malaysia, it's not the only unique country that you need to face a big regime, and in order to have that, uh, you need to have a political force which must be able to perhaps compromise in, someone, in one way or another, which Islamists are also uh, among the important forces. But with uh, separation or disintegration or differences of groups, which could in a way cause uh, difficulties in facing the regime, what would be your view in terms of uh, uh, Islamic political parties splitting? before uh, significant democratic reform is being achieved, uh, which in a way also relates to the situation of Malaysia uh, a few years back. And I would also like to get the response most uh, from uh, Dr. Zul and also perhaps from uh, 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 as well, on uh, this, this point. I initially I wanted to ask this question in yesterday's session, but I will know it's best to have it in this session with the presence of uh, uh, our leaders from Amana. So that's my question. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, very interesting question. Can we have a third one first before I give you those speakers? Yeah, next come. Uh, could you introduce yourself? So I would like to address my question to YB Sarisu. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, no, sorry. My name is Huda. Uh, I come from uh, UAE. Um, I would like to address my question to uh, Amana top leaders, which is Dr. Zul and also uh, YB Sarisu. So basically, before this, we have heard that uh, one of the top leaders of Amana has uh, raised a uh, concern uh, <coughs> with regard to the uh, spoiled boat uh, movement or Uli Rosa. So uh, he said that those uh, people uh, who are propagating for this spoiled vote movement must be punished. So in terms of uh, democracy, basically this statement is against uh, I mean, uh, the whole democracy of uh, the whole democratic mind. So I just would like to know how, uh, I mean, since we're talking about being a truly democrat, I would like to know what are the efforts done internally by the Amana leaders to address this kind of mentality because basically this is not coming out of nowhere. It comes from the Islamist imbued mindset sir. So I would like you to um, tell us the inside story. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, can I start with uh, Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the brother from uh, Macedonia, Amai, I think. Uh, Omar, or Omar. Um, I was in uh, Tunisia when uh, Rashid Benushi made his uh, move uh, of uh, declaring uh, sometimes indirectly, sometimes directly that the Nahda movement in Tunisia no longer had any connection with Islamism. Some of his, uh, some of his movement's members even went further and claimed they were never at any time uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood which is not true, of course. Nahda movement has always been uh, part of the global umbrella of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and I was shocked by the declaration. I wrote uh, several articles in Arabic criticizing the move. This is not what I expected. This is not what my book uh, was about. But I understood the enormous pressure Nahda came under. When uh, the coup in Egypt, because these moves only happened after the coup in Egypt. When the coup happened in Egypt, the military coup in uh, July 2013, Nahda was threatened and its leaders were warned that if they did not desist and if they did not compromise, they were going to end up uh, the way the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt uh, ended. And I think it was probably one of the conditions imposed on them for continuing to be players in the local political scene that they had to dissociate themselves from the Muslim Brotherhood. And they were not alone in this. Many other uh, former 
associations of the Muslim Brotherhood did, did the same. Uh, we were entering into the reign of terror. And people were really horrified uh, that uh, this could happen again. If some members of the Naga even said publicly, we are not willing to go back to prison or to exile. So if you want to remain in Tunisia, these are the terms that you have to agree to. More serious and more dangerous even was the talk about the separation between what is Da'wi and what is Siyasi, what is missionary and what is political. And the decision that if you are a member of a Nahda movement in Tunisia, then you should not be seen to do Da'wah. And that Da'wah should be left to the mosques, and mosques are left for society. And actually that, that was, uh, I gave a statement under pressure, but uh, profoundly erroneous. Because if you give up the work of Dawah, who are you leading it to? And we uh, Islamists, as people call us, I don't like the term anyway, but uh, uh, people committed to working for Islam, our original message is missionary, not political. Politics is part of our work. Politics is part of our interest. Politics is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself. It's not the end to be a member of parliament. It's not an end to have a political party. It's not an end to establish uh, a, a government that observes the values of Islam. But these are all means toward achieving the mission that Allah us, uh, expect us to carry on this on this planet, uh, and, and I think 2015 draws a line uh, in the history of uh, of the Islamic movement of uh, of Tunisia. Uh, it is no secret uh, that there is still a lot of debate within the movement. There are disagreements, and, and I think it is a miscalculation. I could be wrong. People could prove me wrong later on, but. At this point of time, I think it was a gross miscalculation on the part of Brother Rashid al and his movement to uh, make the declarations uh, uh, they made. Uh, you, you can easily say, sorry folks, uh, it's a difficult terrain. Uh, we cannot meet the challenges. We want to take a break. We want to uh, stay out of politics for the time being. By all means, no problem. But to talk uh, in terms that seem to indict your own brothers elsewhere, that's really very dangerous. Because what does it mean to dissociate from the Muslim Brotherhood? That the Muslim Brotherhood is a dirty organization? That it's a guilty organization? There are 60,000 people today in Egypt in prison. Most of them are members of the Muslim Brotherhood because they refuse to endorse injustice. They refuse to accept the oppression that is taking place. These are the real heroes. The real heroes are not those who make compromises in order to survive. Um, I, uh, I mean, you, you have the politicians from Malaysia here to address the Malaysian issue, but let me just give you a lesson from the Jordanian experience about political parties and the split that happens within them. In an, uh, in an incomplete democratic process, political parties and their members feel frustrated because they, they cannot achieve what they want. They will never be enabled to achieve what they want because in incomplete democracies, the regime or people who are in control will decide what share you can have in politics. And once you are more ambitious, they do something about it. This is what happened in Jordan. In Jordan, the Muslim Brotherhood established the Islamic Action Act uh, in 1990-1991 because the 1989 uh, decision by the late King Hussein to democratize the country seemed promising. And there was talk about pluralistic, uh, about uh, pluralism, multi-party system. 
So the Muslim Brotherhood were told, why don't you form your own political party? Because for the next election would be 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 Tension soon started within Of course, he's part of the Muslim Brotherhood, so 
you know, whether it's through you know, Mustafa Shibai or even the time of Hassan al or whatever. But I think, as I have read the book and talked to Shira Sheikh Abushi himself, uh, you could see in, the, in this Malay version, Malay translation, I would the Prakata, and I'm saying that, and I dare commit saying that, this book has in fact long passed by Shia Rashid Ganushi and Al-Nahda himself, and Al-Nahda as a party. Because the latest book of Anne Wolf, published in 2017, uh, the book entitled, it's, it's, it's written in, in, in um, Political Islam in Tunisia. Yeah, Political Islam in Tunisia, the history of al -Nahba. I wrote that in my Prakata, please uh, care to read. I'm, uh, what I'm committed to is that Sherashi Kalushi is still evolving in his thought. And we will all would want to believe. I would personally want to believe that I'm not struck in any, I'm not stuck in any time warp of brotherhood thinking or whatever. I believe the higher intent, the higher the higher objective of Sharia would drive me to make proper political ishtiha, intellectual reasoning that is demanded in all situations. And that is in fact the challenge of leadership. I am not here to be, you know, forgive me, Pradhanza, you know, uh, 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 not to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not obliged to be holden to Ikhwani thoughts or Muslim Brotherhood thoughts or whatever. You know, much as we respect uh, that, that, that narrative of Muslim Brotherhood, but I think a, 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 a political party, you know, worthy of its own raison d'etre, the reason of being here, should be able to relate. And that is exactly what Rashid Ganushi wrote. Uh, and his, his, his contemplation and reflection when he's incarcerated in prison for four years, brought about this book. And later on, and in this, in this I call it as the generational shift and epistemological shift away from Yehwan to me, you know, reflects his, his, his thinking, the trajectory of his thinking. And he's not bounded and beholden to Ikhwa. Although he respects Ikhwa. B. And he always, he, he's always stressing of the Tunisian experience. He always stressing on the Tunisian And he wrote his book, and I was struggling to know that. Where did, did I note that? You know, on the page, in the, in the English uh, version of... Uh, yeah, where have I put it here? You know, he, this is in my laptop, right? he emphasizes that a Nahda is a Tunisian experience. And a Nahda is as much of their tajriba, their experiment in political Islam within the context of Tunisia. And I still remember, and I wrote it in my face on the Malay version that once upon a time Ganushi went to the Murshid of of Ikhwan in it, back in the, in the 60s or 70s or 80s advising Ikhwan to establish a political party and to embrace plural politics he had he had a strong primam he was he was almost like given a, 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 a lecture by Omar Tal Sani the then Murshid Ulam of Ikhwan and again, in the crisis situation where Morsi has to face a life and death situation of Muslim Brotherhood, he went again, and I have a personal communication with Shaykh Rashid Banushi advising them, but of course, you know, given a completely different political thought and thinking, uh, Rashid Banushi's advice was not, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know, but in, 
in short, they do not listen to him. Rashid Danushi, in the situation where he, when Ananda faced exactly or more or less the same situation, they came with a different political response. Now, I would want to believe that this is as a, as a result of political thinking, of a democratic thinking, of a democratic attitude, which I believe, forgive me if I'm wrong, Bertalda, is more imbibed and impregnated in the Ganushis and not the Maghribi thinking, not the Salafi thinking of the Mashrik school of thought, the Kutubi or whatever. I'm not saying Kutubi per se, but the, the Salafi thinking. And I'm not quite sure whether you're understanding me, friends, but you must allow for this. I, much as I don't want to be a judge pronouncing the verdict of who is right and wrong. I don't think we are into that. But what Brother Adam is saying that he, he disagrees with Ganushi, you know, moving away from the F1. No, no, there's no other issue. What is the issue then? <laughs> okay, I don't want to go into this okay. politics. But if I may say that I defer, you know, uh, because I respect Rashid Ganushi's and Anahda's uh, political ishtihad to survive within the history within the Tunisian context, which of course is different from the Egyptian context or even the Turkish context. So I think this is what leaders should be, you know, be bold enough to make that kind of decision. Like how we, from the party of Madagascar, make decision to move away from our past. Because we don't think that it is no longer, we don't, we no longer think that the way the trajectory of the Islamic party, namely past, would embrace this inclusive, democratic, progressive you know, version of the Marxist approach, while we want to remain Islamist or whatever you, we believe that. The political ishtihad that is required now, given the plural society like Malaysia, could no longer be, you know, could no longer be, be upheld in past. So, because I'm coming from that position of understanding the political ishtihad that is most required and most pertinent, given the challenges, I understand how Rashid Ganushi has to make has to make that monumental historical shift. In the word of Dr. Fazli Malik, he made an epistemological shift away from the economic construct. Yeah, the Dalza make a mention to survive politically or compromise or whatever you, but isn't politics isn't politics about achieving a masma. Isn't politics about achieving you know, and contextualizing to your challenge every time it comes about and not compromising any principles of Islam. Just a matter of you know no longer be identified with this one being. I don't have any emotional attachment to that. Maybe Dr. Azam has a lot you know to, to, to carry on that. But coming from us away from you know the, the Middle East, North Africa, Middle East context, uh, I think I for one would want to believe that Sherafi Gadushi, you know, and Amdahda, when they have to make that decision, they they did it out of Ishtihad, out of the intellectual reasoning and responding uh, to the demand of the situation. <laughs> and I think uh, the, the experience, uh, there's a lot more that uh, also I have written, but I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Did I miss Hassan's uh, uh, question, Hassan? Of the speech? I think I've, I've in a way answered you in a more oblique or indirect way. And uh, yeah, Hassan, um, have I answered you? Uh, please, Hassan, is that not wrong? Yeah, yeah. yeah. did I answer you, Hassan? Enough? Uh, 
Okay? That was the thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Before we let uh, the person uh, uh, response, <laughs> I guess uh, the issue that was being brought up by uh, Chef Away Away Mansion, I think it's real in, in our society. Because when you look at at uh, Malaysia, for example, it's almost like 98-99 percent Muslims, whereas in our society it's just about 65 percent Muslims. And you know this issue about being what you say as you know, cannot separate between Dawa and politics. I mean, I think it's a real problem in this particular matter. You know, like we have a lot of issues if we cannot separate between the two. You know, like. There are many, many issues like, for example, in, in, in this multicultural society like ours, for, take a very simple and mundane example, such as concerts. Say Michael Bublé is coming over, and parts, you know, as political party, and has wanted uh, Dawah as well, and wanted to uphold al amrul Ma'ruf or Nahi wa Mukar, then they decided to go out and demonstrate, and Michael Bublé decided not to come over. No, this, to me, it's a real problem in this particular part of the, of the world. So I think that, you know, I don't know, but I think you should respond to what the Zoe mentioned. Well, you see, sorry, because if I may say, there are opinions of Dr. Ashley, Dana Bini, and a few scholars around, uh, not to, not to, capitalize or utilize or leverage on Islam as a political tool in the political contestation. And there is a clear demand, you know, that 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 there, that should not that, that there should be no longer any you know uh, capitalization of Islam to prove that you vote me because I'm Islamic and you don't vote the others because they are non-Islamic. Therefore, you know those kind of directing, those kind of schism, those kind of divide. You know, brings about the need, and I could see, I could see where Rashid al is coming from, especially when they have put in the place the constitution. You know, I, I understand, I fully understand why they come to separate uh, politics from the from the religious aspect because they have given their best to ensure the constitution was as it is. Now the contestation in the political domain is about advocacy, advocacy of advocacy of policy. <laughs> No longer about whether you are more Islamic than I am. So, you know, this is, this is why it becomes... And in this country, where ethno-religious issues, ethnic and religious become a real, you know, a real uh, divisive, very divisive, uh, I think we, we are beginning to see a, a small, you know, uh, 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 a small aspect of what Galushi, you know, attempts to address. Maybe it's not time for us to address it as yet. But already, in this, even in this election, there are people who say that you can't vote for candidate A because he is not Muslim or whatever. So we are getting into real trouble now by going to into this. But as far as we are concerned, Pakistan uh, Malanegara, you know, we believe that we have a, a role to. Advocate Islam that is truly progressive, inclusive, and democratic. Uh, I'm not saying that we are holier than them or whatever. Forgive me, that's not what I intend to say. But at least there is a chance for people to make choices. And democracy is about making choices. Democracy is about managing dissent. And democracy is about having intense consultation in the political arena. That is democracy. Are we having it, or is this a very dysfunctional? And a very, you know, a fast democracy. Uh, Thank you. Well, I think contexts are important because sometimes if we miss the context, we uh, derive the wrong uh, conclusions. Uh, your Malaysian context is a, Mal is a Malaysian context with whatever uh, uh, priorities, whatever problems you have, uh, etc. But in the, in the Tunisian context, the Nada movement started as an Islamic movement, started as an Islamic Dawah movement. If you want to enter into politics, by all means, form a political party. But if you transform the Islamic movement itself into a party, and then gradually strip it of its Islamic character, 
That's the data. I mean, when you read my book now, you will find that much of what Anushi uh, is, uh, uh, says in the book contradicts what he's saying today. That's the danger. That's the real danger. Uh, in politics, you make compromises, you make concessions. It's a game. You play a game. But a thinker, a alim, should not uh, allow himself to be uh, downgraded by politics. We are above politics. Thinkers, philosophers, and scholars are above politics. Because politics can change depending on circumstances. As I told you, until Morsi was in power, there was no problem with al -Nahda. But when the coup happened, they felt threatened. And they panicked. They started discussing what to do about this. So they came with the idea that, okay, now we are a political party. We have nothing to do with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. We have nothing to do with Dawa. Now the country is free, and uh, we have democracy. And the mosques uh, are free, but members of another movement cannot make Dawa anymore. Why not instead form a, diff a separate political party? And let those who want to contest politics work through the political party and maintain the movement as it is, because you need it. Can you imagine, we call him Sheikh Rajd al -Anushi. We call his deputy uh, Sheikh uh, Abdel Fattah Moro. They even wear a jubba and a turban. But they are not involved in da'wah anymore. It is just a contradiction in terms, isn't it? It doesn't make sense. I'm not against division of labor. We need to have a division of labor. We need to have people who enter into politics. We need to have people who maintain the upper ground. Uh, we need people who, can, who make compromises, but we need people who say, these compromises are wrong. We need people to say this and remind us that our ideal and our uh, objective is much higher than this. Maybe we cannot achieve more than this today, but what we hope for is much higher. It's not, it's not about the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is a project. It's just an, uh, it's a means. But you cannot, at a time when the Muslim Brotherhood has been stabbed and is wounded and is bleeding, come out in public and say, we, never, we were never members of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's a lie. That's a lie. And it, it's a painful life. You think probably it's pragmatic in your own setting. No, but you should say, we were once Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood members, but today we believe that in the Tunisian context, it's not necessary anymore. That's what should have been said. Rather than saying, take uh, the remarks you mentioned about the Mashri thought and the Nabi thought. Each thinking is an ishtihad. And you have great ideas in this ishtihad, you have some not very great ideas in this ishtihad. But we cannot neglect or ignore the fact that it was the Mashriqi thought that started the awakening. We need to, to, to remember this. Maybe today we've matured, we've grown up, we have better experiences. But we must not forget that we had a mother and we had a father one day who took care of us when we were weak and who provided us with nourishment. It's just being expressing gratitude, no more. And I agree that Rashid Kanushi in his thinking, he says, there is something special about another moment. And that is the fact that it remained open to other people's experiences and ideas. It did not close itself. So it benefited, it benefited from the Muslim Brotherhood. It benefited from the Iranian Revolution from the Khomeini revolution, it benefited from the communists of the West. It benefited from the West. That, that's exactly what Islam wants us to, to do. <laughs> Wisdom is something, is, is, is what a Muslim seeks. Wherever you find it, you take it. It doesn't matter where it comes from, if it is a wisdom. But to deny that one day, you uh, had uh, connections or associations because somebody is being 
uh, prison, like for instance nowadays, Brother Tariq Ramadan, he, he has been thrown into jail. I have seen individuals who used to think he was the greatest man on the face of the earth, and now they seem to be unwilling to defend him or to stand by him in this conspiracy that is aimed at destroying him. So when one of us falls, we start saying, oh, we have nothing to do with him, it's none of our business, we, never, uh, we were never related to him. What Tariq Ramadan is suffering is a dirty glory by people who want to tarnish his name and who want to destroy someone who has contributed so greatly to Islamic political thought and to Islamic thought in general in this modern age. So we should stand by him. We must defend our brothers. If tomorrow I am imprisoned, you are going to say we have nothing to do with Hassan Tamimi? We never invited him. We never translated his book. We never published it. We cannot keep saying this. It's not right. A principle is a principle. Uh, I don't mind if our brothers in Tunisia come up with new ideas to suit their new realities. But I don't think that what, we, what they have done is ishtihad. I don't, I don't take it to be that, like that. Maybe you and Masli consider it to be that, by all means, you are at liberty to do that. I consider it to be succumbing to pressure. Genius thinking does not come under such pressure. No, no, no. They've been threatened. They've been threatened and they told us they were threatened. I'd like to defer. Well, it's good to uh, defer on this issue. But anyway, anyway, I still nevertheless think that Rashid Ganushi with his thinking up to 2015 was a great contributor to Islamic political thought. I advised her, I, I, I mentioned in my book by the way, that I, I, that I would have preferred Rashid Ganushi not to be the leader of another. To remain free from being confined to an organization. Be a thinker for all Muslims, because this is a genius, this is a great man. Had he stayed away from the shackles of politics in his country, we would have benefited a lot from his wisdom and genius. But I think his wisdom and genius is now being restricted by the political process. He, he should have remained above politics. Uh, can I like, ask you a question? Before, before I give it to uh, Sharon. You see, the, the whole idea that you mentioned that Adnana tried to dissociate themselves from an Alphard and Muslim. But correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong. And the and Muslim moon, when they decided to enter politics, they formed a political party. Al Hizbu, Al Adaya, Al Huriya, Al Adaya, Freedom Justice Party. And yet, you know, and yet, despite dissociating uh, the Dawah movement from the political movement, they failed. And I think, it's my opinion, I might not. They did not fail. It was a military coup? Yeah, I know, I know. It's a military coup? Yeah, it's That's not failure. I mean, you have the tanks coming to you. A military coup is not a failure. You see, if we consider that to be a failure, then we have to reconsider so many things that we learn. There are so many things that the Quran tells us. Had they been left in power, they would have provided an excellent model of Sunni democratic governance. But that is not the issue. Of and that's why they went against them. That's why they sent the tanks to destroy that experience. So I don't consider it to be a failure. Yeah. We could have, we could have arrived at that conclusion had they been left to uh, complete the four years and then people decided they had failed and then elected somebody else. That didn't happen. When we start an experiment, and that experiment is not complete because we were prevented from completing it, we can, you can't call yourself a failure. They prevented you. That, that's, this is what happened. Now, is uh, forming a separate political party a better option or transforming the Islamic movement into a political party a better option? These are differences of opinions. But none of them so far has been allowed to prove itself. None of them. In Yemen, for instance, the movement became a political party. In Jordan, they established a separate political party. In Egypt, they, separate, uh, they established a separate political party. And Nahda turned, became uh, a 
political party by itself. In, in Morocco, they established a separate political party. None of these experiments have been complete and can be uh, uh, assessed as having succeeded or not succeeded. Even in Morocco, the king gave them 10% of power and he maintained 90% of power. Yeah. What sort of democracy? It's nonsense. It's not democracy. They're deluding themselves. Yeah. That's not democracy. We want uh, uh, full, genuine, democratic process and then we people can judge us as whether we have succeeded or we have failed. But if I may just interject, may I? Yeah. The, issue, the, the goal of contention is not about them being allowed to complete their term. The bone of contention was how do you as a leader and in the leadership attend to this challenging moment of your bona fide government elected, democratically elected by the people when challenged in that way how would you respond to this? And that makes a leader from a better leader. Share Rashid Galushi in the situation that he faced and confronted with the same, almost the same similar situation. What did he do? He rendered it back. Dalam bahasa Melayu, serah kembali kepada rakyat untuk menentukan. But a different construct, a different thinking, which I think has a lot to do with the chronic thinking, and as well, maybe, okay, cover, it's okay. What I'm saying here is, Sheikh Rashid Ghanushi was willing to relinquish power and render it back to the people. Let the people decide. Rather than what Morsi did, all due respect, and the consequences that is equated of it is, and they say, but that's not what happened. This is not right. This is not the correct story. Uh, okay, that is not making it, making it. No, 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 this is not what happened. See, Rashid Ganushi saw what happened in Egypt and tried to simplify it. Very complicated. Very simple. See, uh, Rashid Ganushi had the coup not happened in Egypt, he would not have given up power. They were elected by the people. In Tunisia, they won the election. But under pressure, they decided to give up. That's a choice, that's good. Exactly. It's up to them. Exactly. But you cannot say Morsi failed because he did not give up power. People chose him, people elected them. Yeah, similar was Ganushi. No, no, no. Ganushi chickened out. That's what happened. That's what happened. <laughs> this is what democracy is all about. <laughs> the ability to dissent and yet manage to dissent. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Islam, to bring back the glory of Islam, 
must be according to the history of the history of the research. In such a history of how is the number one state in Calabria, Russia, and the state that is under the tutelage of Omar, Sayyidina Omar, Abu Bakar, Osman Ali, and Omar Abdul Aziz. So that particular writing, I think, is written clearly in Hasan Hasan Bana written treatises. There is a Bible Arabs, well, no, a Lyon Arabs. The modern is very written. Then the whole problem to me is that until now, after more than eight years, hundred years. Before that, I would like to say, Brother, we are not going to disown you. 
<laughs> I have to say that I and the Islamic Islamic Front was the first to issue a statement in defense of Tariq Ramadan. And, and despite that, we translated two of his books, Radical Reform and What I Believe. So don't 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 worry about that's that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's good. I have to say that. Yeah. yeah. I'll quickly respond to one's uh, <coughs> position and question. Um, it does not take us any more than to be a political actor within the political construct of Malaysia. When we say Islamic <coughs> democracy, we are not demanding another form of democracy vis a vis the current political construct in Malaysia. For as long as that democracy is functional, in terms of <coughs> intense contestation, <coughs> periodical election, <coughs> rule of law, good governance, and all those principles that are enshrined in the purpose and the high objective of Sharia, <coughs> and finally to deliver what is known as total well-being of the citizenry and humanity. So in that context, this is a this is a problem. Immediately when you call yourself an Islamist or Islamist Democrat, as if you require you, you can't no, you no longer play the game of democracy as it is here. As you exactly asked the question, yeah? Kalau saya paham, mana salah kita memerlukan satu yang lain daripada apa yang ada di sini? Tidak. Apa yang ada sudah cukup baik dari segi memberikan ruang untuk berlakunya perubahan dan pembaikan islah and change yeah. we the islamic or rather we as the party amanah negara we want to believe that we want kita mau menjadi sebahagian daripada the political players in nation rebuilding and perhaps human civilization remaking that is the purpose, that, that is the reason there of being here. And of course, to challenge the monopoly of Islamic discourse that has so far been only held by one political, Islamic political party. And for now at least, you have a choice. Because political Islam is not monolithic, it's, you know, the fact that it provides for diversity and dissent that is the enrichment that we, are, we, we would like to engage and, pro, and in so doing provide you know, for that contestation and finally to allow the people to choose and make informed decision in the periodical elections. And the fact that we are part of this Pakatan and the whole coalition, you know, testify to the fact that we are capable of relating to the political construct of Malaysia. Kita tidak memerlukan satu demokrasi Islam yang seolah-olah ia didatang daripada dunia lain dan perlu pada perubahan. That's not what you should take home. That's not the message to them. Yeah? Got, if I may stress that, it's so important because immediately things like uh, Islamic democracy, seolah-olah demokrasi hari ini sudah ada masalah. As if you are saying that this democracy is, is not Islamic. Tetapi, what I stressed earlier, the essence of democracy is actually that process, yeah, be it a process, be it a, 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 a tool or a system that allows for dignity of men to be safeguarded. That is embraced in the Makassid of Sharia. Sebagai, yeah, this would, uh, sebagai apa yang dikatakan sebagai Hezul Muru'ah ataupun yeah, uh, what is the word? Is the word? Uh, the, the, the preservation of dignity of man. Jadi saya harap uh, you get it very clear from us. You know, that uh, Parti Amanah Negara tidak mengatakan lagi, you know, seolah-olah uh, sistem ini sistem yang anti-Islam, anti-Islam, you know. You know, it's, it's not like that at all. But we would, in the process of engaging in this, improve on the, the function and 
to make this democracy a functional and vibrant one. So that akhirnya, in the final analysis, that total well-being akan dapat yeah, dipenuhi. This is why our manifesto come up with membina negara memenuhi harapan as the Pakatan Harapan Manifesto. I'm going to do Pakatan Harapan Manifesto. Jadi, uh, is that is the question? Another question that I would like to... Uh, What's that question? Well, when the Islam is in uh, power? Yeah, this is a very important, very pertinent question because there is already uh, somehow a notion, yeah, satu, mungkin juga uh, as a result of our own failures. That when, is not, when, when Islamis or political Islam or political parties, Islamic political parties come into power, then, you know, they do exactly the antithesis of what they aspire or they, they profess to do and they advocate to do. And you can be already seeing this in Turkey, already, you know, those examples that you have given earlier. Yeah. Now, I for one... For example, if they are wrong, where is the Western? Where is the Western? Where is the Western? I'm only confining it to the uh, to, oh, to what has been to, to what is information. Mm. Muslims people. I mean, when did the Islamists ever rule in the West Bank? Mm -hmm. And Morsi was a dictator. Is, is that really a fair judgment of the one year Morsi rule? I mean, we have to be really fair when we judge people. Okay, Otherwise, okay. we are just giving misinformation. No, I don't think it's right either. But we, we confine it to the constitutional. A, a, a constitutional minimum he attempted and that he is free from judicial review of, you know, the judicial review of that position, that is already moving and progressing into, you know, into, into at least anti-democratic uh, principles, okay? Because in Islam, in Islam, I dare say that the essence of Sharia in terms of governance and political governance is the principle of al-ilzamiyya to shuro that debate in the legislative process and contest is bound is, is binding on the head of state wa amruhum shuro wa innahum wa shawirhum fil amr the two verses of the Quran in so far as I understood it and now I come to understand it and it's you know, very clearly spelled out by, by the, by, 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 you know, by, by uh, contemporary Islamist, contemporary Muslim thinkers, that the essence of political uh, system in Islam, that the, the number one, the president or the prime minister, is bounded by the decision of the legislative process. And that is truly democratic. You know, that is truly democracy in its entire sense. And and and, and immediately you see uh, Morsi or whoever, or even for that matter, Erdogan, you know, I'm not saying they are, but already you, you have seen that, that, that kind of evidences. Uh, I have my fear and I have my anxiety that is exactly what I think Ganushi's approach is always, you know, Sorry, I'm, I'm not today. I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm really yeah, because you are Ganushi in a Malaysian political. No, no, but, but Ganushi, Ganushi is very against all this autocratic, despotic, or you know, retrogression into anything that is impinging on the rule of law. So sorry, I remind Islamists, we they in power about to become, you know, the power that be, that the maqasid of Sharia, the purpose and intention of Sharia is that in the construct of a political system in Islam, that the rulers are not beyond re uh, review, not beyond contest, not beyond debate, and not beyond criticism. And because that two verses of the Quran talks about the principle of al-izamiyya to shura. That shura is binding. It is ilzam on the rulers. So with that, I take your note as a reminder to all political parties 
you know that that, that the nuances of Islam yang bernuansakan Islam berpaksikan Islam berdasarkan Islam that no one of them should in the name of God try to deny the right of the democratic process and the legislative process eh, berpandukan kononnya bercakap atas dasar mewakili Tuhan dengan hanya making mention of two or three verses of the Quran I thank you <laughs> of course, uh, we are all human beings and we all have the tendencies to be Fir'aun. Every one of us has a small Fir'aun. And that's why the democratic procedure consists of checks and balances in order to prevent people from monopolizing power. But when you give examples, you have to be honest and fair when you give the, 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 the story and the context of the story. Let's begin with Erdogan, who have you, you, you have presented as if he was a dictator, which is really utterly unfair to Erdogan. President Erdogan is elected. There is a parliament in his country. His party has a majority. He rules up to a certain term. The people of Turkey have the right and enjoy their, that right to vote him out of, the, of power if they think he has not done well or he has exceeded his powers. President Erdogan is coming under so much attack in the Western media, which I regret seems to influence some of us, simply because he is a man with belief. He believes on the basis of his Islam, this is a Muslim country, it's Muslim concerns, he stands by Muslim uh, victims of oppression everywhere, so he's always attacked in the West uh, because of this and because of that. In reality, his country under his rule is coming under so much pressure attempts to have a military coup, uh, mobilize the Kurds after having reached uh, an agreement. I hate to, uh, to, to, to find myself in a position of having to defend uh, Erdogan or anybody else, but you need to know the context under which an elected president is functioning or is, uh, is uh, trying to steer the country uh, uh, out of the uh, uh, field of mines in which uh, he finds himself. The example of Mursi, that Mursi issued uh, uh, a decree offering himself power. Okay, talk about the context. Parliament was dissolved by the army. The constitutional court was under the control of the army. And whenever Mursi wanted to do something, the constitutional court, <coughs> under the orders of the army, uh, intervened in order to nullify it. How can you do anything in a country like that? You are an elected president. You are an elected leader. You have a term to lead the country and then people will judge you afterwards. The uh, notion that whenever you want to do anything, you have to have a shura, that's not uh, realistic. Yes, you probably have your advisors, you have your parliamentary group, but a leader is a leader, you have to lead. Look at the Western democracies. You think Theresa May, every step of the, of the way, uh, in, invites Parliament to discuss whatever she wants to do. Only on major issues they do this. But then people will judge when the time of election comes. I don't know where the West Bank came from. The West Bank is under occupation. If you mean Hamas in Gaza, then you, they, they, this is not true. The context is completely different. Hamas was voted in uh, 2006 uh, to rule and it was never allowed to rule. And that led to a conflict in 2007. So you, you need to really to know the context about which you are talking. Where are the Islamists who have been empowered, who have ruled and have become dictators? You talk about Lantan, I don't know about Lantan. Uh, probably you know your, uh, your situation uh, better. But to just uh, to uh, generalize like this, that when the Islamists become, uh, come to power, they become dictators, that's possible, of course. And that's why we need to have checks and balances. Yeah. 
We have to have, we need to have procedures in place. But who is obstructing the, the, the passage toward democratization? Tell me, who? The Islamists? Who has put all these hurdles in our way? Because they don't want proper democratization to happen anywhere. Because when the people have the right to choose, there will be no more stealing of wealth. There will be no more corruption, or at least much less corruption, hopefully. That's the nature of things. So, just uh, be careful when you give an example. Give a proper example. Uh, let me tell you something about Hassan Turabi. <coughs> Hassan Turabi, I interviewed him for seven hours in my TV program, as uh, it was 90, it was 2008, I think. He told me his story with the Muslim Brotherhood. The story is as follows. He established an Islamic movement in Sudan. Then when the Muslim Brotherhood were persecuted by Jamal Abdel Nasser in 1965, out of sympathy and support for the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, he offered to join the Muslim Brotherhood. Later on, he had disagreements with them over a variety of issues and he decided to pull out. It's as simple as that. There's nothing sacred about the Muslim Brotherhood or about being part of the Muslim Brotherhood. This uh, history of uh, Islamic movements, the history of the struggle uh, for uh, revival is so complex, there's so much to say. So when we pick an example, when we quote uh, someone, when we cite an incident, we have to accompany it with the context in which it happened. Otherwise, we will end up not doing justice to people. I think we can have one last question. One last burning question, if we have. Otherwise, I'm going to close this session. Anyone? Anyone? Ezra? All right, so if there are no more questions, then uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Julia, Dr. Julia Shreshnikova, our fellow, to uh, give some final thoughts and to give a token of uh, appreciation to all the members of here. Every time, Dr. Farouk, you are getting involved with pronouncing my family name. Um, it's very pity that we have to adjourn. Um, but um, first of all, I would like to ask you to join me in another round of applause for our panelists. I would like to invite here Shamir Zulfidal uh, to present uh, the book. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, to present the books uh, to our panelists. Uh, they, um, yeah. So um, can I um, invite here first uh, Dr. Azam Tamimi?
invite you to join us for the modest tea after that. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa